life, culture and current events from a biblical perspective. 2020 with Neil Johnson on Vision. Back with Family Voice Australia and uh, over some previous conversations, Andrew, we've been discussing family responses to some of the challenges that we are facing here in Australia and putting real pressure on cost of living, those challenges, the rapidly changing systems that are happening in our education system, our health system, our welfare system. Well, Andrew, uh, you're talking about clearing the decks today and preparing a church for action. And some might be thinking, what's all this about, uh, clearing the decks for action, as though there is a looming crisis that's upon us. But I suspect that that is the case if we look with what's coming into the new year. How are you seeing this call to clear the decks and get ready for action? Well, what we know, Neil, is that we've been letting the state, and by the state I mean state governments and federal government departments over over two or three generations gradually take up the slack when it comes to education and health and welfare. We actually started this you know, back in the 1800s with education. We thought it would be a good idea if we had all these state government schools. Well, the thing is about that is that costs a lot of money from the taxpayer. When we delegate things to others, someone pays for it, and it's the taxpayer every time. So in letting the state accept the responsibility for the education and health and welfare of everybody in the community, that has meant there are, well, firstly, massive bills to pay by the taxpayer, and secondly, it means that we don't get direct control anymore of how these things are working. It's delegated to a government department. It's delegated to a minister. So you're having this discussion later about the, the looming power crisis. That's simply because the, the crisis is arriving on our doorstep over a period of months or even years because we've delegated these things to people who've got their own ideas how to go about things not necessarily in the best interests of the average person in the street. That causes problems. So okay. we have to sort of go back to scratch every time and say, well, how do we get here and what do we do to fix this problem? Now, this is a very important point to recognise here. Uh, in a conversation like this, and uh, listeners who've been listening to this regular segment over the last month or so, uh, you'll appreciate uh, that uh, Andrew has got a real focus on the value of family and what happens in local churches. And uh, some will be saying, well, aren't we all just thankful that there is state money that's going to those education, health and welfare issues, uh, takes the pressure off the church? Aren't we in some ways thankful for that? But as you say, Andrew, uh, with a crisis looming, with some challenging times ahead, we don't know how bad that might actually end up being. But uh, you're saying this is actually something that you need to think about as a Christian. And it's almost a revolutionary way of thinking about being a Christian, because a lot of things have been lost uh, to influence that the <coughs> local church has in dealing with those areas and, and how you actually win some ground back. Let's come back to a biblical uh, foundation here. Uh, you've been thinking through some issues around how things change. Uh, where do we start with the Bible and thinking about a revolutionary way that families and churches take back some of these responsibilities? Well, we can start today at, at the book of Acts in chapter 6. And as we read that through from verse 1, it says, Now at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint arose on the part of the Hellenistic Jews against the native Hebrews because their widows were being overlooked in their daily serving of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation of the disciples and said, It is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, brethren, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we may put in charge of this task. So verse 1 speaks about the widows. Now, we might think, well, what, what's this got to do with church? Well, it has a lot to do with church. How does it work? Well, it works out of the fact that the New Testament 
builds upon Old Testament law. Those aspects of the law that are rendered obsolete in the New Testament are set aside. So what are these? Well, in the Old Testament, we had the blood sacrifices of animals. But today we have in the New Testament era, and that comes up to today, of course, the one-time sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. His blood was shed for sinners. Right after Jesus died, the Bible tells us in Matthew 27, 51, that the veil of the temple was torn in two. What does that mean? It means that from that point onwards, everything that was done was then obsolete. It was, in fact, it was worse than that. It was now, it, it was of no consequence. If people wanted their sins forgiven, they would need to look to Jesus himself, not to the animals who, were, who had been previously the means for sins to be forgiven. So we've gone from blood sacrifices of animals to the sacrifice of Jesus today. We don't use animals for sacrifices anymore. In the Old Testament, the focus was on the nation of Israel with its seed laws and land laws, but now it's the holy nation, which is the church. The Old Testament emphasis was on the geography of the promised land. That's changed today because Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples of all the nations. So we've got this massive transformation taking place, coming to the New Testament, but we're still, we haven't thrown out got the baby with the bathwater. We haven't thrown out the fundamentals of Old Testament law are still relevant today. <laughs> and Old Testament law spoke a lot about the care of widows. So the care of widows, and let's just broaden that, uh, the care for our elderly, the care for our immediate family members who perhaps haven't got that capacity to care for themselves. Let's also include there uh, the care for orphans. Uh, there's uh, lots of references in Scripture about how we care, and sometimes we'll give a donation to a charity and we'll feel like we've done our bit. Uh, but what you're saying here is uh, churches uh, clear the decks because actually, even though we have some state welfare that looks after the needs, the immediate uh, dollar needs of those who might be in need, and uh, let's hope that continues on uh, indefinitely in some respect, there is something that the apostles recognised, that it was actually a responsibility upon them to provide some care for uh, these widows. So uh, in some sense, we take that even as a New Testament foundation, perhaps even a principle uh, that in, in church life, we are to have uh, some sort of provision for uh, those who are in extra need. Well, yes, this, this is right, Neil. And so you find when you get to the, to the, um, the, the later books of, of the New Testament, we find that Paul talking about in 1 Timothy 5, how there was to be care given to widows. Now, the first point of care for widows was always going to be the family. And we have in the first, first book of Timothy, chapter 5, Paul lays out the very strict guidelines about how these widows were to be cared for. Only certain ones were to be cared for because if they were able to go to work, they could support themselves. And, and, and at the same time, Paul gave very moral guidelines about the kinds of people who were to be supported. But once again, we come back to it all has to start with the godly family caring for its members as best it can. Now, it is true. There will be widows in church who don't have family or, or they're, and they're actually very vulnerable. So there will be some widows who do need some care from the church but it should always start with their family. Uh, how do we make sense, Andrew, just a little aside here, uh, of uh, whether in the first century, at the time when these uh, accounts were written, uh, what sort of care may have been provided by the Roman Empire or uh, from Jewish authorities who might have been in charge in the, uh, in the nation of Israel? How do we understand uh, what might have been happening there? And, uh, you know, getting that contrast as to where the apostles saw their responsibility to the widows. 
Well, they certainly didn't look to Rome to care for them because Rome was, was a form of a government. It was a pretty rough and ready government, by the way, as we, as we know, that essentially, like most governments, their, their first rule is force. This is what you must do. You do not have any kind of discussion about it. This is the way it's going to be. And if you had some complaints about the way that the Romans were handling you as a citizen, you'd better be fairly careful how you talked about that because they could view you as a, as a threat and a rebel. And unless you were very discreet and cautious about that, you could finish up um, get, getting some pretty rough treatment. So we don't look to the... We, we, we never find in the scripture uh, uh, any, any suggestion that we should look to government to help us out. In fact, many, many times historically, governments have been a threat to the church rather than a help to it. They may say, oh, we love the church, we want to give them money, yeah, but that always comes with some kind of strings attached. And I can tell you after working in, in, in education for years, the strings attached are definitely there and they're always there. There are always going to be conditions for the, for the getting and receiving of government monies. Okay. I don't think right. that's such a good idea. All right. And we've talked about that too, uh, the bramble. Uh, for listeners who might remember that conversation, hey, uh, when we talk about the church though, uh, we've got this presupposition and uh, take us back to first century times and really quite quickly now and uh, how this works now, uh, the church had money. Uh, people were generous uh, in that uh, around that time and the birth of the early church, really, really generous, able to meet all of these needs. Sometimes we wonder about the giving in our local church and perhaps there needs to be a deeper focus there because I know that not everyone in church gives as generously as they ought. What are your thoughts here for uh, for actually making that storehouse uh, a powerhouse? Well, that's that's a that's a good phrase to use from the storehouse to a powerhouse. I think that's very in, a very sensible way of looking at it, Neil. What what we've been saying over these last weeks is that is that power flows to those who take responsibility. And if we accept the the obligation of the Christian to tithe, then we say, okay, well, the, there's teaching on the tithe that you find it there in, say, Malachi chapter three, and 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 what we know is that these these widows were probably supported by the payment of the tithes and offerings to the church. What had happened was the church had now been set up. We, this is post Christ. Post resurrection, we now have this, we now have this institution operating. So all of, all of those three thousand or four thousand believers that we had there were now, I can only assume, paying a tithe to the church. Therefore, there was money there. So it means that the church it, it does have the capacity. It does have, as it were, bank accounts. We do have money to provide for things. But it all comes back to the the willingness and the the faithfulness of the Lord's people to pay a tithe of their income to the church. Uh, interesting here, isn't it? Uh, I'm just thinking as you're describing that sort of thing, uh, you know, the, uh, you know, a V8 motor, you know, uh, when you got it running on all cylinders, uh, just sounds fabulous. And it's got all that power yeah. under your under your foot. But if it's only running on one or two cylinders, it splutters and carries on and there's no power at all. And in some sense, when we talk about giving in our local church context, uh, we actually turn our local church into uh, the V8 when it might be feeling like it splatters along on just a single cylinder or two. Now, I just want to touch on uh, some, some things quickly and uh, not a lot of time to unpack all of this, but our local church pastors, uh, if we're going to be the powerhouse, we've got to have our local church pastor looked after and flourishing and able to then be the person who implements the strategies to make all of these things happen. And I know you've uh, even indicated some concern that uh, perhaps pastors are not looked after as well as they ought to be. Well, that does happen sometimes, and it, 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 it creates problems. And we find in the epistles, Paul, Paul talks about you know, the Old Testament principle of, of feeding the oxen while he's, while he's working. You know, the oxen doesn't get fed. He, he doesn't feel like working. 
And so, yeah, so the church needs its oxen, as it were, its leaders, to be fed properly for the church to thrive in the community. If we don't have the oxen at work, well, there's no ploughing, no sowing, no reaping. So let's feed the oxen. Let's provide for their income so that they can be about town doing their job, going about their business, doing some good in the community, teaching the disciples and, 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 and discipling the people of God so that we have some good things happening. You know, I know that a lot of churches have experienced the fact from COVID where they haven't returned to the same numbers as they did have pre-COVID. And I'm assuming that that probably affects the giving that happens in local churches too. So if you've got your church pastor uh, thrive, uh, you're surviving uh, perhaps uh, even in the tent maker sense. Uh, they might have a, you know, the side hustle that happens just to make ends meet, uh, trying to lead a church and uh, just sort of surviving week to week. Uh, you've got to be actually able to look at, uh, you know, not just giving in the local church in just a small way to just get you up to speed, but actually how do you make the whole thing flourish? It really means that everyone does their part. What are your thoughts here about here in this sense, uh, you know, clearing the decks for action because action's going to be necessary? Well, it is going to be very necessary and a big part of that's going to be paying pastors and paying for them to be able to go and do things rather than finding themselves constantly strapped for cash and, 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 and struggling themselves, if they've got that, that clear pathway where they can be going to people like parliamentarians and, and their local council and dealing with things around them and visiting the needy and the poor and encouraging people in the things of God and getting around town and seeing the different members of the community, both in, in the church and elsewhere, it means that things are going to be happening. We're going to have elders and deacons at work. We've got care for the needy. And that way, we actually make sure that we're doing what we ought to be doing. We can start that process just as people there in the pew by paying our tithe. It makes a huge difference. And the good thing about that is there's a blessing promise in, in Malachi 3. And you can read those, those verses. Powerful promises when people will pay their tithe to the Lord, to his church. So we go about that. We we, we, we want to clear the decks because, as you say, we've got some challenges coming our way with power and many other things. We kind of go, well, how did all this happen? Well, we've got to say, look, we do need the family, we need the church, and we need the state, and ideally all of those institutions working harmoniously. But they all need to be to be paid up to speed and operating that way, we can see some harmony in the community, everybody finding their place, and we clear the decks for action, and we ask the Lord to send his blessing on, on what we do. All right. Action required for hard times ahead. And, of course, church leading in hard times looks a lot less glamorous uh, than some of the images that we might have of church leading when times are good. And uh, let me just point listeners uh, to connect with Family Voice Australia. And, of course, Andrew McColl is Family Voice Australia State Director for the State of Queensland. Uh, but you can connect with Andrew through the Family Voice website, familyvoice.org.au, and check out the other resources that are on the Family Voice website and uh, support uh, Family Voice, too, uh, in all of their different uh, state directors and the national campaigns that they are running from time to time as well. Andrew McColl. Thank you so much for sharing your heart with us once again today on 2020. Thanks, Neil. It's been nice being with you. Thank you. Thanks for taking time to listen to this audio on demand from Vision Christian Media. To find out more about us, go to vision.org.au. 